Has anybody ever experienced the joys of poor timing? You know, like just poor timing in whichever shape, way or form. Like, have you ever been the person that asks someone how their boyfriend slash girlfriend is and they just start crying? I've got that anointing. Like God has given me that. Like he's been like, Chris, I will put it on your heart. Like I might never ask you about your relationship till the day it's over. At that day, I'll be like, so how is it? And everyone's like, ah. I've just got like a, it's like a gifting, right? I will never ask you about your job or I will come up to you and go, so did you get promoted? Actually got fired. Great. Good. Feels good. It's just like, oh, I just do it, right? I, I, I just have the timing things like down. It's like yesterday I went, I was praying at this uh, event in our, in our city called the Chicago Hoops Classic, good event about silencing the violence in our city. And um, I come home and you know, and sometimes you come home, you're just in a good mood, right? I was happy go lucky Chris. I was like, I'm home. And I came in with jokes and, but like home was crazy. So like my kids were like tearing up stuff. Kingston took cake and instead of eating it, he just drew, painted himself with it. Because as a kid, you do what feels right. You know what I mean? You're like, yes, this cake should be eaten, but it feels better to paint my face with it and my new clothes. What? And so I walk in and I'm cracking jokes and Audrey just gave me that look. When Audrey does that, I already know. I already know that, you know, I just, I, I, I often, this is my prayer. When Audrey does this, I'm like, if you want to come early, Jesus. If you would like, if you see fit to rapture your servant, I'm cool with it. I came in and then I, I thought, well, you know, Ords isn't up to it. So I go up to my mother-in-law and I'm like, hey, the cake that you made is amazing. And, she, and it was for today. And she's like, you better have not tried it. I, go, I did, it was amazing. She goes, you better not. I was like, okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> Timing, it's just like my gift. I just come in at the wrong moment. I go in the conversations. I will go talk to couples right when they're having a domestic. I'll be like, so? And they're just like, it's just like what I do. It's like a gift. And, and, and not only that, sometimes I miss some of the greatest moments in life because time, of timing. When, when the Patriots were playing, like I, I looked at what was going on and I was like, look, it is, it is possible that Tom Brady could pull this off, but it is not likely. And Ords asked me to do something and I thought, look, this is a great moment to stack up some brownie points because Ords knows it's a Super Bowl. I'm a man, I wanna watch it. And if I go get something now, like the brownies, they just go, they go up. You know what I mean? Like I, I go from, hus I go to husband of the year, right? And so I come back thinking, you know, whatever. And I'm like, what? What? I just missed one of the greatest moments in sporting history. Just, just missed it. I walked away too early. And I think I've done that so many times. I watched the Yankees game here in, in Chicago, Yankees versus uh, White Sox. And I was like, I'm not into baseball. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's a reason it's called America's pastime because it's on all the time. So you can pass time while you, do, while you watch that sport. You know what I mean? You're like, man, let me go do the groceries. Let me go have a family. Let me like come back. Like it's still going on. You know what I mean? Like, so I was like, yeah, it's Americans past. And then like, they'll go home run for home run, not knowing how unusual that is. I walk out early and they do like a walk off home run and everyone's like screaming and like, oh my gosh, you missed. I'm like, <laughs> I just miss stuff. I miss stuff. Cause if I'm really honest, and this is maybe hard to believe, I'm impatient. Yeah, I know, right? Like I'm just impatient. Like I want it now. In fact, I don't want it now. I want it yesterday. Like I am the guy that huffs and puffs when I have to wait at the waiting station at a fast food place. I'm like, really? Really? 30 seconds. You're going to make me wait over here. Pull up for 30 seconds. Like I, I just, I'm impatient. I want it yesterday. I want everything good in life now, yesterday. Problem is this, that when you walk away, you actually miss it. I want to speak to you from the subject today. Wait till overtime. Wait till overtime. Some of the best things in life have happened in overtime. All the greatest sporting moments happen in overtime. You don't think it can happen. You don't think the game could be tied. You don't think it's gonna happen, but it does. And when it does, it is a game to remember. Have you ever walked away from a moment in your life, I wonder, too early? Have you walked away from an endeavor, a dream, a relationship? Have you walked away from a moment that you've been heavily invested in and for whatever reason, you just looked at the outcome and it seemed unfeasible that it could turn around? It seemed not likely that it would shift. But I wanna say this, most people don't live the life that they want because they walk away too early. Yeah. Most of us walk out 
when it doesn't seem likely. But you've got to, there's a problem with this because if God is the master painter of your life, God majors and usually waits and works His best work in the realm of the unlikely. He works with unlikely people. He works in unlikely timing. He works in unlikely odds. If you look at the Bible, the odds are always stacked against it. It is, and I gotta tell you, like, I'm not happy about it. I'm not preaching this because I'm like, hey, yeah, I love this. I don't like it. I'm like, God, why, why put us through this? You know what I mean? Like, why not give us it early? But God loves to just do it at the last minute. Like, and this is just what it is, but it's true. He works with unlikely. And although it is uncomfortable, you gotta be thankful for it. Because it means this, that he does things with people that the odds are usually stacked up against them. He does things with people that they shouldn't be believing for what they're believing for. He does things with people and he seems to have a theme. He takes ordinary people and he increases their capacity and he increases their life story to something greater than they would have seen. And I believe this. No one in this room is here by coincidence. No one in this room is here just because you showed up today. It is an appointment. And what I believe is this, that you might live in unlikely circumstances. And if you're old enough and live long enough, you will find yourself in unlikely circumstances. You will find yourself in times and places where the most logical thing is to get up and walk away. But I gotta tell you this, that it is those who can stay till overtime that get the victory worth talking about. It is those that wait that see God's plan. And most of us quit right when God is about to show up. Yeah. And it's not just us. I mean, the disciples, when they, you know, with Jesus, they're walking with Jesus three years. But they, it's funny because no matter how close you are to God, I think you just don't know His plan. Yeah. It's one of my personal peeves with Him. <laughs> Sorry, like, but I'm saying it for real. Like, you know, He's a hard boss to work for. Because yeah. I'm like, really? Like, just, why just, just show up early. Would it kill you? Just once, just show up early, just show up early. Like, why do you have to, why do I have to have almost no money? Why do I have to, um, before you show, why do I have to have no team? Why, why do I have to be losing three nil? Why, why do I have to be a business in the craziest industry and time to start one? What, what, like, I mean, I would live longer. Wouldn't you love it if I lived longer? God, I could do so much more. You ever bargain with God? I start, I start reasoning with Him all the time. I'm like, if you did do this, if you did do this, I would do more for you. <laughs> if you did give me more, I would give more away. I mean, that's, that's a good deal, right? It's for your kid. And we reason. Yeah. But the reason we reason is because we don't see what He's doing. And the disciples didn't see it either. They walked with him for three years. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, you've got to understand, that is like the anticlimactic moment of all like history. You ever had one of those moments where you're like ramped up, like this is going to be, this is going to be epic. And then you get there and it's like the worst. You know what I mean? Nothing works. Nothing goes to plan. And you're like, is there really, is there a God? Is there a God? The disciples went through this moment. And you've got to understand what they saw in Jesus. They saw the Messiah, but they didn't see the Messiah doing what the Messiah did because they didn't know His plan, you see. They knew who He was. They had no doubt in that. They knew who sent Him. They had no doubt in that. It's funny, I think we're mostly in the same place. We know He's real for the most part. We don't doubt that He came. We're cool with that. The part I think we struggle with most is His plan. Waiting, trusting, standing, when it makes no sense, when it's painful, when it's illogical. This is where we struggle most. And they didn't even know his plan. They thought Jesus came as like David, right? Like a warlord. They thought he was going to be like Jason Bourne. They thought he was going to like come in. He was going to kick down some doors. You know what I mean? Like, you know, just, just take over. And that the Roman Empire was going to like crumble. And that Israel was going to be planted straight back in the materialistic gains that they were always promised. It's like, that's what they thought. So imagine you're like, yeah, we're, we're. I mean, you would, you would roll with, with a different confidence, right? If Jesus is walking with you, you'd just be looking at everybody like you'd be walking past Pharisees like, what? Yeah. What? You know, you look at my boy here. Look at my boy here. You know who he is? You know who his dad is? What? You know, you'd be just different. You'd just be different. You'd have a different confidence. And imagine you got that confidence and you're like, what? Look at my boy. Look at my boy. How you like me now? And then you look up and you're like, he'll come down. He'll come down. When he comes down, when he comes down, I don't know if he's coming down. 
And when he breathed his last and he said, it is done, I gotta tell you, the devil struck a very harsh blow to these men that, and followers that were close to Jesus. Because for a moment there, it's easy for us to know in retrospect, but for a moment for them, their victory had been taken from them. Imagine thinking you found hope. How many of us as Christians have fallen in love with Jesus? We go to that first worship moment and we're like, man, he is real. How many of us have a story? In fact, in this nation, most of us have a story of being in church, being in a relationship with Jesus, but all of a sudden Jesus doesn't come through like Jesus says he does. See, I don't think we have a doubt whether he's there. We just don't know what he's doing. And I think we struggle to comprehend, to get on board and to embrace his plan. And so you see these disciples, they would have been like rocked. In fact, you know they were rocked because they went back to do what they've always done. Have you ever thought that maybe the reason you go back to the things you run from is because you don't see the way forward? You ever thought that when you get rattled, you'll always go back to your strongest foundation? You ever thought that that's just what happens? Mike Tyson said it best in his eloquent way of speaking. He said this, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the head. Great wisdom from Mike. I agree with it. (laughs) My plan would surely be affected the moment I got punched in the head. I grew up doing like, I did Kung Fu for like a month. I thought, man, I thought, whoa, anyone, look at at me. Just look at me. Like, And then I got punched in the head and it's funny how the Kung Fu went with it. You know what I mean? I just went back to the windmill. I was like, you know, I'm just gonna go back to overtime. Because we all think we're there. We think we know God. We think we're good in life until life hits you. And when it hits you, you will always go back to what you came from. And this is true even of the disciples because below, even though they knew Jesus, salvation could not happen unless Jesus rose again and showed and presented Himself to them as resurrected Jesus. That's when salvation took place for the very first time on earth. But if we rewind a little bit, they were rattled, man. They were rattled. So take heart and take confidence that even the disciples got rattled. Even the disciples walked off track. But what if there's a remedy to this? What if there is something that we could embrace here on Resurrection Sunday that would shift this, that would bring Jesus straight back into the midst of relevancy, midst of power, midst of a God that can do things in you that you've maybe given up on? I think that there is something we could glean today that will shift our course and make us stay on the course that God has called us to. I want to read you just a big, a quick snapshot of, where, of, of like the disciples, just to paint the picture even further. The disciples, they've been rattled. You know, Jesus died. And this is what we, where we pick it up. This is the disciples, John 20, 19. It says, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, man, they got rattled. And rather than living in a victory, they closed themselves up. Here's the thing. When we get rattled, we start to live our life protective. We rather live on the defense than live on the offense. God has called you to live an offensive life. I'm like not a defensive. Like I get really frustrated when Christians only pray when they're sick. You know how we do that? We all do it, I do it. We're like, you know, we're all cool, we're all cool. But then we get the flu and we become like, we're, we're praying like T.D. Jakes. You know what I mean? We're, we're bringing down the house. But like prior to that, we're not saying anything because as Christians, we don't often have a understanding of our main goal and of kingdom. When you know kingdom, you realise that you are there to pray offensive prayers because what Jesus gave you is not that you might live comfortable, but you might live as a conqueror, taking ground, helping people, setting people free, not standing there and and living stagnant in your freedom, you're meant to be someone who brings it to the masses. See, right here, when you get rattled, you seal off what God wants to set free. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. What we see here is this, that your breakthrough and your shift of attitude happens when you put your faith, not in the fact that Jesus died, but in the proof that he rose. See, Jesus is doing something in our life. Point number one is this. What do you do when you can't see the plan? What do you do when the plan is not evident and it makes no sense? It's real simple. You do this simple thing. Everyone can do it. Everyone's real good at doing it. We all have this capability. You do this. You 
It's glamorous. It's going to change your life. You're gonna, honestly, you're going to see me after in the foyer and you're going to say, man, I, I wasn't sure about the accent. I wasn't sure about the combination of the suit with the jeans and I was not sure of the loud bass. But now I can say this, that that was... You ready for it? You've never heard this before. Never heard this before. And it is so... I mean, just, I just, I'm ready. I'm going to drop the mic when I say this. You ready for it? I wish I had a drum roll. Stand. No? No. Cool. Okay. Okay, I thought that was going to go different. Stand. Just stand. The Bible says when you've done everything that would stand evil, stand. And then when you've done everything, keep standing. Oh my gosh, I know. Not only does he not show us his plans, but his advice is so rudimentary. Stand. What do you mean stand? Just stand. Because here's the thing. If you stay standing, you stay on course. If you stay standing in the moments where the plan does not make sense, you will get to the destination. If you notice in the Bible, Jesus always shows up to the places that he sends his people. So when God sends you on a journey, when God sends you on an endeavor, the best thing you can do is not to get off course, but to stay the course. Stay standing where He asks you to go. And it does not make sense and it does hurt sometimes. But here's the thing. While you stand, you make a stand that the world takes a look at. No one put their confidence or hailed someone or speaks about people or makes t-shirts after people that run. But there is something about someone who stands. The best athletes that we enjoy watching today are not those that are the most brilliant. In fact, I would say this, that the greatest potential in the world is usually untapped. But it is those that know how to stand. Stand the test of time. Stand through the trial. Stand through the storm. Because here's the thing, storms come, but they don't have to move you. Because the storm will pass. The waves will subside. The giants will fall. But if you don't stand, where will you be? Because for some of us, the plan is ripe and ready. But the problem is this. Rather than standing, we've gotten good at running. Rather than standing, we take a seat. Rather than standing, we take another diversion. And the problem is this, that God has a plan for you and He is faithful to see it through. But if all we get good at is running, we start questioning our God's faithfulness when it's not His faithfulness that is the issue, but our stickability. I am not here today because I am the most brilliant person that could have led this church. I am not here today because of any of those reasons. I am just good at doing one simple thing. I stand. And you know why I stand? Because when I don't know what to do, it makes no sense to do something that is pointless. God gave us a direction. He told us what to do. And because He's told you what to do, just stand. And if you stand long enough, I guarantee you things will turn around. More marriages are saved by standing than anything else. More people get their breakthrough from standing than anything else. There is a tenacity in that. There is hope that rises in that. And I want to encourage you, if you feel like running in this season and you want to run out of what God has for you, or you want to run out of what you've committed to, can I tell you, there will be more lessons learned when you stand than when you run. See, when you run, your eyes are fixed on your past and you inevitably end up there. When you stand, your perspective has still not been robbed. Stand. Stand and keep standing. Point number two. I've often felt like a little bit disheartened by the fact that I don't know the the, 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 uh, the plan, right? Like, I don't know the plan. And I've often felt like the devil knows the plan. Anyone know? I think we all do that because we all blame the devil for everything. You know what I mean? Like, devil gets everything. Like, you run out of gas and you're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not today, devil. Not today. I'm going to stand. Well, in that situation, don't stand. Go to the gas station, fill up. You know what I mean? People will often say, well, people don't have faith. Everyone has faith. And our faith goes through the roof when we see that needle going empty. We don't care. We're like, I believe I can make it. I believe I can make it. We get to orange. I'm like, woo! My wife is a faith driver. She loves it. She's like, zero? Let's do this, God. Let's do this. I'm going to show my children a lesson. See, we have faith. Faith is simply where you put your belief depending on the outcome that you absolutely think is going to happen. And the good news is this. 
the devil's not in everything. He's not. And I think ownership will do more for your life than blaming God or the devil. Ownership puts the power back in your hands. Ownership means there are things you can do that God can bless. See, I've got to tell you the news. The devil is not in everything that you think he is in. And let me tell you why quite often what he is in is kind of irrelevant. The devil doesn't know God's plan any more than you do. Isn't that good? Yeah, yeah, that's it, Chris. So pumped. Let me tell you why it's good. Because if you're attacking an enemy, your greatest element beyond all your preparation and weaponry is the element of surprise. Is the fact that they don't know what you're doing and where you're doing it. And the beauty is this, that although we have a real enemy called the devil, the devil doesn't know God's plan. In fact, on the day that Jesus was hanging on a cross and the disciples were downcast, the devil was strutting like the man. He was like, you, oh, like I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. Because what he saw was the Son of God dying on a cross. He did not know. Because if he did, he wouldn't have wanted it to go down that way. Because the moment that that blood spilt, a bloodline was open. Royalty is carried in the blood. Our salvation was carried in the blood. And while it was locked up in that body, we were still locked up in our transgressions. But the moment that that thing broke, everything broke out. Everything shifted. The devil did not understand this. If he did, I doubt that he would have gone for it. See, the devil doesn't know God's plans any more than we do. But what we have is this. The greatest element that we could have, and I I really believe this, is the element of trust. Have you noticed that God does not tell you details? Have you noticed that God does not major on the details of what is happening in your life? But what He does tell us to do quite often is to trust in Him, to just to abide in Him. All these relational verses. God, I love that you're lovey-dovey, but come on, man. Give me a plan, something solid. Why? And it dawned on me the other day. When you know someone's character, you never have to question their content. You don't need to know the content of His plan as long as you know His character. If you know His character, you know that He is faithful. So regardless and irrespective of what you don't know, you know one thing is He is faithful. Irregardless of what you do know and don't know, you know this, He comes through. And what you don't know is always gonna be far greater, but it is who you know that will determine the level of your living and the level of your believing. So when we put more trust in who we know, we start to actually stand in the plan that was made for you and I. But what the devil does, the devil's whole goal is that he could lay out an alternate plan or an alternate path and get you following it and not your father. And what he does is this, he plays on human logic, human reasoning and human currency. Meaning this, our currency is do good, get good, do bad, get bad. Makes If someone's gonna forgive, you or you're going to forgive someone, they have to earn it. You notice that? You make people earn your forgiveness. God teaches, it to give us, teaches us to give it away. Forgiveness has nothing to do with someone earning it. It's something you own and you give. See, the devil, this is what I believe the devil does really well. The devil knows you, right? He's been like a sideline spectator for the longest. Like he knows. He knows everything you did. He knows what you did last summer. He knows, he knows everything you wish. See, I love doing those little ones and I love when people get them. (laughs) He knows, he knows, he knows it all. I would say he knows you better than you know you. He knows your fears. And this is what I think he does. He takes and He knows the pots that He can dig into that are gonna shake you. He knows what He's gotta do to get to you. And He starts to line it all up. Ready, watch this. Boom, boom. All that matters is in my head, I live the dream then. Okay. 
He takes things and He knows you. He knows everything that He can dig up that'll rattle you. You ever notice that what rattles someone else doesn't rattle you? You're often like, someone says something, you're like, what? And you even say things like, what a wuss, get over it. Yet for you, like you got, I I heard there's a fear of dots that are too close together. Yeah, there's a, yeah, okay, there you, you feel it, you feel it. Some people see dots and they're like, for me, dots, I'm like, okay. Because none of us are afraid of the same thing. And the devil knows this. So he digs in and he knows what he can do. And if Jesus came, the Bible says that God did not send a condemner, He sent a Saviour. He sent someone to lift you up, bring you to life. Well then, I think what the devil's greatest tool is, is to counteract that by doing something absolutely opposing. And I would say in this room, everybody is ready to live their potential, but none of us feel it. And the reason we don't feel it is because the devil banks on his job being effective. And this is what he does. He digs into our life, right? He starts to look into our life and he starts to say, well, if I can just throw some doubt their way, it'll start sticking. And just like when he thought that the devil, that Jesus was dying and it was over and he starts to throw doubts into the disciples. See, he's not the Saviour that you thought he was. See, you're not maybe as worthy as you thought you were. Are you kidding me? You think he had real Saviour, the real Messiah would have picked you, you uneducated people. How are you ever going to do something great for Jesus? And he starts to throw things. Oh, really? Your marriage is going to make it? How many marriages have made it out of where you are right now? How many marriages have got out of there? You're not going to make it. Oh, a businessman, huh? An entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, huh? How many people ever do something great that are called entrepreneurs? Aren't you afraid of failing? What will your friends say? He starts to throw things, not realizing that all the time and all that moment, God has been working in the background of your life. And while the devil mages on throwing dirt and hoping that it sticks, throwing fear and hoping that it sticks, throwing all these different doubts and hoping that your fears will overcome you to the point where you would not know any, that you would no longer stand, but that you would run out of the places and and the plans that God has for you. And he relies on it so much so that he starts to throw and he picks up his throwing and he does whatever he can to get in your way, hoping that it'll stick. The problem is this, that grace is not something you fall from. Grace is something you fall into. So while the devil thinks he's bringing you down, when you stand in the position that Jesus gave you, which is you stand in your relationship, you stand in grace, meaning this, that you have never been and will never be the sum of your achievements. You are the sum of His salvation. It means that your identity is no longer in what you have done or what you have failed in, but it is in what He has done and what He has successfully done for you. You start to see that the more that the devil throws dirt at you, the more that grace starts to stand out in you. And when grace stands out, because God steps in, ordinary people do extraordinary things. If the church lived like this, you wouldn't hear people say, I can't go to church because the church is so judgmental. The church is not judgmental. It's actually the devil in your mind that is playing the greatest judgment. What you think you see. But the reality is that God does great things with what the devil tries to throw at you. So what does that mean for you and I? It means we've got to do better at standing because the more you stand to become a human target for what the devil wants to throw at you, the more that grace starts to stand out in you. And I think as a church, man, we got to become like, we got to become a different breed of Christians. We got to become a different breed of Christians that aren't afraid of the people in our workplace or in our society. And that we would stop asking questions like, can this person walk through our doors or can they not? The reality is this, it is not you and I's job to be the convictor of people. That is the Holy Spirit's job. You know what our job is to be? To live risky grace and risky generosity that makes absolutely no sense and makes people think, man, am I even worthy of this? This is what we're called to do. And when we do this, all of a sudden, ordinary people start to grow bigger shoulders and their chin goes up a little bit. And we start to do extraordinary things because we're not waiting to be qualified. You'll never be good enough for a God plan. But God has given us grace. Throw up the last verse for me. I don't know if we're gonna see it through this. I love it, it's Romans 5.15 and it says this, 
nor can the gift of God be compared. You can't even compare it. With the result of one man's sin, how often do we hold up the validity of God with the reality of man? The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. You have been justified. It has been made right. And I don't say this as just an Easter message that you might believe in God again. I say this because this is not about just belief. This is a tone for being what you're called to be because before you walked in this room and even if you never believe in Jesus and if you never walk back into church again, you're still gonna have to juggle and, d- and deal with what every human deals with, self-doubt. But my real question is how much of it is self and how much of it is the devil's plan? You gotta understand this, I said earlier that if God, if we viewed Him as a compassionate, loving God, it would change the way we see things. And I've heard that said that the greatest trick that the devil has ever pulled is to convince us that he's not real. Because how could he be? Why, why is he interested in you? Why would he want to bring you down? What have you ever done? You're a good person. You know what I mean? You do good things. You give the clothes you no longer want to the poor. You know, but you got to understand this. Have you ever been bitter? I'm going to make a confession. You can all judge me. I'm okay with it. I'm a bitter loser. I am so competitive, I hate losing. When people say it's just a game, I'm like, what? Monopoly's a game, and even that I don't like to lose. You know what I mean? When I play, I play to win, and I, will, I am happy. I will run until I taste blood in my mouth. Like, you know that moment? Like, I will do that because I hate losing. There is no such thing as, I will walk on the street, and when I walk, I'm, I'm competing with the people ahead of me. I literally am. And I'm like, I walk, and I'm like, by next traffic light, man, by next traffic I'm hunting you down. Chris is coming around the corner, Chris, Chris Carmen. Like, this is how I, I just literally, I know I'm too vulnerable, you look at me different, but I am. I'm competitive. I'm just like, and, and, and when you lose, I, I'm not proud of it, but if you're like, if you're playing soccer with me and, and you're just ahead of me, I, I, I will join forces and hold on to you just a little and I will drag you down just a little. If you're guarding me in soccer and we're at a corner and you're taller than me, I will jump off your feet. God's still working on that part of me, I guess. That's my way to redeem it in the church. Oh, well, no, no, but I know it's bad, but God's working in him. I will do anything. And when I lose, I really got to get better. Over the years, I've gotten better at just going, be gracious, Chris. Don't be a bad loser. Because when you're bitter and when you've lost, you want to do anything to bring those down with you. And the devil hates you, not because of what you have done, but because of what he has lost. And he is so bitter that he has lost. And what's the best way to get back at God is to get at his creation. So he spends his life placing doubt and throwing mud. But when there is no grace, mud sticks in a very different way and it paints a very different picture. But when there is grace, it just makes the picture. The Bible says that in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. I want to live with some perfect strength. So it means I've got to embrace my weakness and let grace be the painter of the perfect picture that God is outworking. See, we don't always know the plan, but if we stand long enough, the cross looked like it was game over. But thank God that Jesus threw it into overtime. And when He threw it into overtime, the disciples have lost hope and they were about to walk away from the game. They were about to walk away because it made no sense. We might as well go back to where we came from. We might as well be what we've always been told we are. I'm just a fisherman. We're just a bunch of people that are now going to get hunted by the Romans like we better hide we better run but here's the thing Jesus threw it into overtime and if we would put more trust in God's ability to take your problems into overtime your doubts into overtime your business into overtime things would shift and if we would stand there long enough I guarantee God does not just tie up the game He does what? He is more than a conqueror He does not just justify you He takes it and He makes it a victory so you could be more than just someone who gets through you're the person who makes it to everything that God says you're called to be. Grace is not an equalizer, it's an unfair advantage.